Good afternoon to everybody uh, in uh, Greece, uh, in Cyprus. Uh, my name is Jose Domingo Cruz, and uh, this is my presentation on uh, the digital new normal. Uh, I hope I'm in the right room. I think I'm in the right room. There shouldn't be another presentation other, otherwise. And uh, I'm here by the good graces of Philip Dici, uh, uh, who uh, invited me to come and give you a talk uh, from my perspective as an instructor in Japan and uh, with my experience having just written a book on um, what I do with Zoom and what I uh, would uh, like to show you in terms of what I think is coming up uh, for uh, both publishers and for educators in the next coming uh, while. Uh, as uh, other people have noted, uh, we would like it very much if you could keep your microphones muted until the, um, the question period. There'll be a question period after I go through my first set of slides and then I transition into talking about uh, my, my teaching environment here at my desk. Uh, but otherwise, if you could keep your uh, uh, microphones muted. Um, uh, if I see microphones that I need to mute, I'm, I'm very merciless in that sense, and I, I will mute you myself, uh, especially if um, we hear any background noise. Um, if there are any questions, you can put them in the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, uh, but otherwise, um, we should probably begin. Okay, uh, first, let me start my presentation here, and I will uh, share my, oops, let me Move my chat and I will share my screen. Okay. Um, I titled this best practices for the digital new normal, uh, even though when I think of the word best practices, I'm not absolutely sure uh, if these are the best practices. Um, these are suggestions that uh, 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 I, I came up with that I think might be good uh, starting points for people to think about how we should be thinking about what's going to be happening in the future. So uh, without too much ado, Uh, first, a little bit of an introduction about me. Uh, who am I? Um, I have been based in Japan since um, basically uh, 1991 and uh, went through the stages of being a private uh, school instructor uh, all the way to a high school instructor and then moved on um, into uh, teaching at university, private universities. And now I teach at um, a city university here in Southern Kyushu, as well as one of the branches of the national university system, uh, the, uh, the Kyushu Institute of Technology. From about January, when I realized that this pandemic was going to be all over the, the world and would eventually soon be in Japan, uh, I noted that um, I had to do whatever I had to do to get ready for the coming semester, which in Japan starts in April. The, the, uh, the new school year starts in April, and in January, uh, it usually is the end of the semester. So from February to March, uh, that's usually our break, but I took that time to try to, uh, in, in an emergency frame of mind, learn as much as I can about what I could about online teaching, which I was not good at, uh, as you will find out through the rest of this uh, presentation. I'm not someone who actually likes using much technology and had no experience at all teaching online. But by the time I got done, uh, I became a leading member of Online Teaching Japan uh, and um, helped uh, a lot, I think, of other instructors, um, leading seminars, uh, professional development seminars, uh, and. Um, and eventually became well enough known that I was approached by my publisher, uh, Dorothy Zemak, to write a book for her. And the title of the book is Teaching with Zoom. And I'll be teaching a little bit of the contents that are in there. Um, let's see here. I um, need to just do one quick thing. Um, let's see. OK. Um, I wanted to talk about this whole situation. So what is this pandemic uh, that we went through? Uh, what is the uh, situation that we had? And first view it in terms of the negatives, okay? Um, what did we see that we didn't like? Well, first of all, I just came from a town hall that was um, uh, for uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Pacific, Australia, and New Zealand. And there were participants from Kazakhstan, from Nepal, from New Zealand and Australia, <clears throat> pardon me. And um, it was very, very interesting to hear their perspectives and the things that they had to deal with in their own pandemic um, situation in their own countries. Uh, 
and they were describing how it was very difficult to reach to their uh, normal um, constituents and the students that they normally teach because those are students that were hard to reach. They were indigenous students in Australia and in New Zealand. Um, and these kids were demotivated to actually try to get online because all they had was their parents' cell phone. They didn't have a comfortable place to study. Uh, the materials couldn't reach out to them. Uh, in, in Nepal, um, internet connectivity was certainly not a sure thing. So they resorted to trying to do uh, lessons by radio or lessons by TV. And by, um, you know, by comparison to that, by that very stark contrast that I uh, got a quick, um, got quick exposure to just a couple of hours ago, I realized this little bit here about the digital divide, when I was going to talk about how there were some uh, people uh, in Japan, in, in the country where I work, that had some connectivity and some that had excellent connectivity, it really puts everything into perspective. I'm talking about a rich country where some people maybe have a slightly slower internet connection than others whose Wi-Fi is a little bit unstable. Uh, but when I hear from other people in countries who are talking about, um, you know, poverty, poverty itself being the problem that uh, a lot of students have, it makes me put all of this in perspective. But we did uh, experience a digital divide, not just in terms of the technology that was available in each home or the connectivity that reached into each home, um, but also too the attitude that, um, maybe some parents of younger learners and professors and teachers themselves had to uh, digital materials and digital material delivery. Oops, keep clicking off that. Um, one other thing that we uh, observed in the past 18 months was the lack of agility by large organizations and um, schools, institutions, universities, and even instructors, as I mentioned themselves, to immediately adjust to the situation. Um, it took a while for some people to sort of get their heads around the fact that um, teaching online, teaching synchronously or asynchronously was the reality they had to face. And there was actually some resistance. Uh, some professors were saying, well, look, uh, it's not my job to actually learn how to use these video cameras and this computer. Uh, send somebody over to my classroom. I'll go into my classroom and you can record me doing my lectures. And they literally would just go into an empty classroom, do a lecture in front of a camera, a chalk and talk lecture and said, well, do what you want with that. And uh, we'll give the kids a test at the end of the semester. Not exactly what you expect in terms of the most progressive attitude towards um, taking advantage of what we have in front of us, which is um, the, the incredible potential, the incredible possibilities in terms of what it is that we can do with uh, digital material delivery. This lack of preparation, this resistance to new technology and new methods was something that was laid bare. Uh, because in my group, uh, Online Teaching Japan, everybody in there, whether they were of, you know, uh, they had a lot of trepidation to actually um, do, bring in a lot of this material and bring in a lot of the methods, internalize it and, and turn it into part of their pedagogy. Um, we all tried. Um, there were professors who didn't even really want to try very hard, but at least the people who were there tried and wanted to discuss it and wanted to learn from each other. And that's what I think was really important in what we were doing. There were some positives, though, out of the past 18 months. And let's take a few of those, like a look at a few of those. Um, th those people that were trying, they wanted to reassess their methods. They wanted to figure out better ways. They wanted to listen to each other. They were flexible in their thinking. They, like me, I'll tell you my own personal story. Um, my specialty is in fluency and authentic materials and teaching kids how to learn to speak uh, without um, using a lot of textbooks. I, I disavow textbooks. Sorry to say that I'm, no, I'm at a publisher's exhibit, but uh, uh, for the longest time, I disavowed textbooks. And I thought that um, if little children, you know, first language learners in their country could learn how to speak their first language at three or four years old without learning how to even write, much less how to even read, uh, that we could do this basically by spoken input and spoken output. So if we, if somebody like me can go from that attitude and then learn how to do what I have come to do, I think it, it's an example of not just me, but a, a lot of the people uh, that um, were there in, uh, in the online group. Oops. Um, 
This led to, uh, over the past 18 months from all of these professors, um, uh, the, to, to contribute to this rise in digital tools. And digital tools is a big part of what I'm gonna be talking about a bit, but basically suddenly, this new willingness to actually take up these tools, this new willingness to try new things, suddenly brought digital material delivery, brought digital uh, pedagogical tools to the very forefront. And where before, you know, I knew that my university had a Moodle. I knew that, you know, there were things like uh, Google Docs, and I did use them for my collaborations um, in other projects, but never in my classroom. I found I knew that this stuff could really, really do something uh, and enhance my teaching. Um, but not only for the classroom, in terms of how we communicate in professional development, in terms of how, for example, I communicated with my editor, who is in uh, America on the West Coast, and how she communicated with Philip Dietschy uh, here in Greece, and then how I communicate with people from the south of Japan all the way to the north of Japan, the friendships that I've made that created community, that created a very important set of bonds uh, for people, even when we were trying to be socially distant, um, was something that I noted was a great positive that came out of the uh, pandemic. Now, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the term ERT, but um, what I'm going to be talking about is, is a paradigm shift from this basic concept of ERT, where a lot of people think we still are, even though, you know, I, I don't think this is an emergence anymore. The E in ERT stands for emergency, and the R is remote, and the T is T, emergency remote teaching. So in the first part of the pandemic, uh, a lot of the uh, instructors that I was talking about were, were people who were trying to um, figure out how to um, think about the new situation. And there were a lot of people that were very, very adamant in saying, you know, what we, what we have to understand here is that we are in an emergency remote teaching situation. It became almost a slogan, a shibboleth, that uh, we are in ERT and that means that what we can do is very limited and that there will be problems and, and, and that there will, our students will experience problems, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, it's good to be aware that you are not where you should be, but it almost created a problem in the sense that it, um, it led to, um, what should I say, almost an excuse to not rise to the occasion to be able to meet our students' needs. And I think a lot of people, when they're thinking about emergency remote teaching, have a very negative view of it and wish to get out of this emergency remote teaching and immediately return to the past. They want to get out of where they are and they want to go back to the past where they thought it was much better. But unfortunately, I don't think we're going to go back to the past. Uh, there is no way to go back to where we were before because the genie is out of the bottle. If nothing else, um, uh, one of my friends who teaches at uh, a large university in Japan has pointed out that this uh, part of the genie, of course, is evil and part of the genie is good, but there are things about this pandemic, about the new situation that we face, where um, it makes it much easier for uh, certain institutions and, and certain circumstances to make things more difficult for instructors to actually execute what they want to do in the classroom for their students in terms of their relationships to institutions. Our relationships to with institutions as instructors have changed and our relationships with students have changed themselves. There is no going back to the past. This emergency remote teaching situation can only move forward. And if we don't see that and we keep just thinking, oh, I can't wait to get back to my classroom and just do what I used to do, uh, I think we're going to be um, abandoning a lot of potential uh, for what it else that is uh, possible. So when I'm talking about this paradigm shift that I'm in right now, or that we are in right now. I want to make it clear with three acronyms what it is that I think we're going to experience. So first, I explained about uh, ERT, okay, emergency remote teaching, where um, there's going to be learning loss. The digital divide is going to be very wide. Um, instructors are going to be confused. Students are going to be confused. And so we certainly cannot do what we are, are really meant to do. But I think, and uh, with the help of um, the friends that I made at Online Teaching Japan, I can see a better way uh, to look at that. Uh, and instead of emergency remote teaching, um, my friend Adam Jenkins, 
uh, it, uh, a professor at the Shizuoka Institute of Science and Technology. He, uh, since about 2005, had shifted all of his teaching and, and, and made a big move. He himself went through his paradigm shift and made a big move towards using Moodle, a very popular LMS all around the world, but very popular in Japan itself, to use as the center for digital uh, material delivery and an, an enhancement of his normal classroom. He still, of course, taught in a classroom with students, but because he centered his uh, materials on digital delivery, not just paper delivery, not just textbooks and academic writing using pen and paper, but um, using all kinds of digital tools. He did not think of this as emergency remote teaching. He thought of this in terms of reduced or altered tool set teaching, the acronym being RAT. Kind of an unpleasant acronym, but it sticks in your mind and it's easy to remember. Reduce or, uh, reduced or altered tool set teaching. Um, don't think of it as an emergency, he would say. Think of it in the sense that, you know, suddenly your tools have changed. Maybe, you know, in your perception, your tools, you know, the chalk that you normally use, uh, the whiteboard marker that you normally use, um, you know, you go to a new university and maybe they don't have the same projector or they don't have the same cabling system. Maybe in a sense it's been reduced, but maybe, uh, for, in, for example, in my case, I started a new, at a new, uh, I started at a new university a couple of years ago, and I was in this wonderful uh, multimedia room where I had projectors pointing at every wall, uh, different projectors that could use different screens, and um, the Wi-Fi connectivity in that, in that university was fantastic, and um, I had wireless access to the multimedia uh, panel uh, for the teacher. That is an altered tool set. That was certainly not reduced. That was much better. And if we think about the things that are in front of us right now, I think he would say that maybe we can find some real nuggets of gold there. And if you go even beyond that, and you think about what we have in front of us as not just an altered tool set, but an enhanced tool set, and it changes the way that you think about these things that are in front of you. So these three acronyms, ERT, that's what we might say we are in, although uh, Adam Jenkins would say that's a very limiting concept. Um, RATT, RAT, Reduced or Altered Tool Sets Teaching, is the transitional um, paradigm that you might want to use to think about uh, the sudden onset of the pandemic and making everybody socially distant. Um, uh, and then to enhance tool set teaching, where we might be able to think about things in a different way to actually enhance our pedagogy. So emergency remote teaching. A lot of stress for students, instructors and administration, we're all socially distant. We're not used to answering our email at you know, four o'clock in the morning from our students. Uh, students themselves uh, went through a lot of stress. They, they need the social interaction. Uh, that is a big part of their learning when they're unhappy. There's a lot of science that says when you're unhappy, you're just not gonna learn very well. You're very happy as a social animal with your friends. A lot of that was taken away. Um, in Japan, your high school graduation ceremony, your entry ceremony into into university uh, your ceremony uh, meeting your your circle friends your club activities these are all really big things in Japan and there is now that we are in this over a year and a half there are some kids who have not experienced any of that and that is a really big part of what culturally it should be part of growing up they haven't um, they haven't experienced that instructors have been very stressed because they they themselves um, are in a very strange situation and of course the people in the office you know um, crap rolls downhill all the time so the people at the top tell the people uh, below them who tell the people below them who eventually tell the instructors these very unpleasant missives and directives that nobody understands because everybody is shooting in the dark um, the digital divide becomes even more pronounced, as I was mentioning before. Sorry, I'm going to have to start speeding up a bit because I'm using up way too much time here. And of course, the whole issue of learning loss. This is what emergency remote teaching meant to a lot of people. Now, let's move away from that. What is this thing called um, RAT? And coincidentally, 2020 on the Chinese Zodiac actually was the year of the RAT. It was a really interesting coincidence, uh, I thought. Think of RAT as a more precise definition of your relationship to your classroom. Instead of just thinking, oh, this is my classroom and I'm here to teach. Okay, we're finished. Bye, kids. See you next week. That you start taking 
an inventory, a survey of the things that you can do. And maybe you always took it for granted that there would always be chalk in the classroom and there would always be an eraser. And that was fine for you. For me, it certainly was. But if you start thinking about the tools that you have, then you start thinking about the tools that were gone, the tools that you have right now, and the tools that you can employ, but have never employed, but could employ if um, your administration were to, to give you leave or you actually asked for help from the administration to bring in these tools that you've never used before. So some of these tools are missing, um, but some have simply changed. Um, you know, instead of going from an analog overhead projector, now you have a digital projector that connects into your computer. Well, if you are stuck at home, that projector isn't at your home, but now you have Zoom. You can do your screen sharing. And screen sharing, honestly, is way better than connecting your computer at the compute, uh, um, I'm sorry, at the computer bench in your classroom to the projector. There's so much more that you can do with Zoom as opposed to just, you know, uh, sending your PowerPoint slides out to the projector. And if we understand all of that, then we can transition to, um, out of the, uh, the, the, uh, the slightly, or not the very pessimistic idea of ERT, the slightly uh, pessimistic uh, idea of RAT, and to, to, to transition to something more uh, with uh, ETT, Enhanced Toolset Teaching. Now, what is this Enhanced Toolset Teaching? This requires a paradigm shift. So you have to start thinking about things in a different way. Think about what if you were somebody who worked um, outside of your house in your driveway and your specialty was in making tents. You have a big pile of canvas towards the garage. You have your cutting tools. Uh, you have you know, your favorite scissors. You have a big stack of zippers over there next to your tent material. And then there was a big storm and your, your, your materials are gone. Your, your favorite scissors are gone. Uh, all of your stands and all of your tables are gone. And you're thinking, what am I gonna do now? But when the storm subsides, you notice that your stuff went downstream, but from upstream came a whole bunch of new stuff and they landed in your, in your driveway. And you look at all this stuff and you go, hey, what is that tool? Hey, what is that tool? Hey, that looks, uh, look, looks interesting and it still looks usable. If you think about it in that paradigm, you have lost maybe some tools, you have lost maybe some materials, but as the storm taketh your, uh, some of your tools, it also gave you some new ones. And as you look at this new stuff and you start taking inventory of it, you can start thinking, well, I used to make tents and I'm really good at making tents, but hey, that looks like a, a, a table saw and, and that looks like a, a driveway paver and that looks like a laser level tool. Hey, maybe I can start making houses. It is possible that you could actually uh, use these new tools that you discovered to actually make something different, make something better. So to all of the people who are thinking there right now, think about all of the things that you weren't able to do before that you might be able to do now with the tools that are in front of you. Um, maybe you heard about things like flipped, I'm sorry, flipped classrooms. Maybe you heard about things like task-based learning or maybe something even bigger like project-based learning. Maybe the time is ripe to go away from you know, your basic textbook um, um, PPP work and to actually just go into something a, a little bit more courageous. And you have way more tools now to actually help you implement those things. And not only that, you have much higher connectivity and community with other teachers that are doing that. And maybe they can help you take uh, the first steps towards these new methods. before I go on and I continue talking to other instructors uh, like myself, I, I wanted to mention a few things. I know that this is a publisher's exhibit, so I think there are a few publishers that are pub probably watching, and I don't get to talk to many publishers or as many publishers as, uh, as uh, I, I am right now. So I want to take a few moments and talk to uh, the publishers and tell them what I think as an instructor you might want to watch out for as new opportunities coming out of this pandemic. If we understand the concept of um, enhanced tool set teaching, this is what we need as a new paradigm to help us on future courses of action. And as publishers, those new opportunities, if you think about them primarily, not just to make money, of course, there's nothing wrong with making money, but if your first 
mm, goal is to think about what teachers needed out of this uh, pandemic. And, and, and specifically, I thought about that first, okay? You'd go miles. You'd be the first people that got out there with new digital materials that was specifically to help teachers in this situation, not just, you know, well, we have, we've been in development of that textbook for a long time, so we're going to stick with that development cycle because that's what's best for our publishing house. I understand that, and that's worked in the past. But to change course, like a lot of instructors did uh, back in January, back in March of 2020, to change course quickly. And then, you know, you can write yourself the, the other materials that you have once you've adjusted to this course change. Uh, that is in the name of helping um, instructors while we're still in uh, the throes of the pandemic. And I got to say, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm being pessimistic, but I don't think uh, we're going to be safely back in our classrooms until 2022, around this time. It's going to be another year at least. And um, if you can make that course change very quickly using digital delivery, which is very, very flexible and very, very agile, I think you can make a lot of new friends. And the time is ripe, okay? Um, teachers want to improve their pedagogy. They have discovered that, you know, teaching online isn't so bad. They have discovered that, um, you know, using Flipgrid or Quizlet, hey, this really enhances uh, vocabulary learning. They are ready for uh, these new materials. And if you can provide them, you're going to help a lot of people. But you also have to understand that you have to meet us where we are. We're, we're you know, we're up to our necks trying to survive ourselves. And I know you are too, but this business opportunity needs everyone to meet everybody else halfway. So if we're going to buy new materials, we're ready to buy new materials that are ready to help us specifically. How do you meet them halfway? Well, I, um, I don't think that I have seen a better time for publishers to reach out to people like me who were not at all enamored with textbook uh, choices in the past. Uh, I was very much, you know, anti-materials. As I said before, I don't think you really need them to teach fluency. Um, there were a lot of teachers who were not very big into digital materials. They just basically wanted to teach what it is that they taught before. Uh, they know exactly how to run group work and, um, you know, is fine for them. But now that they've learned LMSs, now that they've learned these other digital tools, they are primed to look for other digital materials and other digital delivery systems that were very similar to what was introduced in the book. Okay. Okay. okay, I will have to mute someone here. Okay, I think it was that person. Uh, so uh, let me get back to what I was saying. So uh, teachers are primed now to actually uh, to, to meet you halfway and to, to mm, take up these digital materials. And these teachers that were once loath to actually try new things have a new perspective. You approach and, and leverage that new perspective, you'll be ready to, uh, to take up new opportunities too. But remember, you can't just sell a new textbook saying, oh, we're, this textbook is full of information about the pandemic and it's all about social distancing and about uh, you know, what happened in Malaysia and stuff. It has to actually take advantage of digital delivery uh, in the ways that I'm about to describe. Okay, uh, what are these new pioneering opportunities? Um, remember, oh gosh, here's a textbook. Remember these things in the back of most textbooks, these DVDs? Now, mine is already opened because I, I will normally open uh, all of my textbooks that I have to work with, get the DVD, and I got to say, I rip it down. I put it into files that I can put into my, into my uh, smartphone or my, uh, my tablet and uh, so that then I can bring it into the classroom, play it from there. Mine is open, but um, sometimes, you know, I've got a, a minute uh, at the end of the semester, I ask my kids after grades have been issued, hey, I just want to ask you guys, can you open up your textbook to the back and uh, tell me, uh, open up that textbook to the DVD, and I want to see anyone who hasn't actually opened up their DVD, and inevitably, you know, you're going to find about three or four people that actually haven't opened up the DVD. Those DVDs, um, Probably, you know, as an instructor, I can say to students, hey, you know what, you've got to do your listening at home, and uh, that's uh, really important. But now, in the pandemic, a lot of us put those MP3s, you know, uh, put a, a lot of those videos with the help of the publishers, uh, with links to from our LMS to their own websites. 
and students knew that they were accessible on the website. So they didn't have to like take that clunky DVD out, put it in a DVD player, turn on the TV and watch it from there. Digital materials delivery is something these kids got used to. And I got used to it too. Those DVDs are no longer necessary. And the costs of making them, uh, shipping them, uh, developing them, uh, storing them can be transferred to the costs of digital material delivery. Um, and you don't need to reinvent the wheel when, I, when I'm talking about digital material delivery. Okay, there are open source LMSs like Moodle. Uh, there are closed source systems like uh, Canva. There are commercial systems like Quizlet, but they have uh, open access to anyone that wants to make a Quizlet set. Those are the tools that we got used to. When I'm talking about tool sets, those are the tools. Those are examples of what we got used to and students got used to in terms of um, being able to access new ways to study. You can take uh, a Quizlet set, build it yourself, put access uh, into your textbook using QR codes and say, here's the Quizlet for this particular chapter in this textbook. And you can be quite certain that if that student or if that teacher has not used Quizlet, you know that Quizlet puts their effort into making their interface easy to use and fun with their, with their games. Use that commercial development by the, the, uh, the commercial developer to bring that and in tandem with your textbook, work with it. You don't need to build proprietary systems. Proprietary systems were something that was in the past. And you, you built proprietary systems maybe because you thought that Moodle was just too open or you didn't know how it would work, but you don't need to build proprietary systems now. Instead, understand that in open source systems, portability between LMSs, portability between this Moodle course and that Moodle course, this Moodle quiz can be moved to that Moodle quiz as a matter of course. And if you understand that as part of your game plan, uh, when you're creating new textbooks or creating new materials, you're going to get probably an, an awful lot of cooperation, if not actual recommendation from Moodle associations or from teachers themselves saying, yeah, textbook is great. I can, I can, I can download their entire course and then because it's Moodle, I can make my own quizzes and they give me an email when there's a new quiz available for that chapter or there's an update to that chapter. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised up to now that, of course, I've never paid much attention to Moodle, but Moodle has been around for quite a while and that there hasn't yet been a publisher that took advantage of open source LMSs. So my final points to the publishers, okay? Um, number one, cut down on plastic waste, okay? Uh, the environment could use a, a helping hand. So cut down on those DVDs and hire a couple of IT guys that know their Moodle well, just to work with the pedagogical experts that I know exist within your publishing houses to really put together some thoroughly, you know, uh, um, kick-ass uh, Moodle courses. Uh, do not use proprietary systems. Do not reinvent the wheel. Use what is already out there and show that you understand the open source thinking uh, that, um, that already exists and has been fostered by professional development groups, professional learning groups like mine that says, wow, Moodle is really great. That LMS is okay, but it's very proprietary and you've got to work by their rules, but Moodle is open source. That's the way we think. That's the way we talk, at least in our uh, PD groups. Now, let me talk to teachers a little bit here, okay? This journey from uh, RATT to ETT. As instructors, what should we be looking for? Uh, we go from RAT to ETT, okay? Remember this phrase, because this was my, my phrase around uh, maybe July, after I realized the, all of the advantages that digital delivery can give to my classroom, I really did say, I'm never going back to paper again. And I was thoroughly a paper and pen guy. Now, if for nothing else, okay, I'm never going back to paper again, was basically the whole idea that I don't want to touch my students' papers ever again. Uh, I, 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 I know they touch them. I know that I might end up touching them. And although I know, you know about the science of virus uh, vectors and, and the risks of transmission, uh, that I really don't want to, at least for the next three or four years. And because there's digital delivery, um, I don't need to anymore. So this is something that I think a lot of teachers will be thinking about. As I mentioned before, Sit back for a second and think about all of these things that are in front of you. 
I mean, you might be thinking, man, I hate teaching at home. I feel so isolated. I'm single and I want to meet my students. I want to meet my friends in the teacher's lounge. Okay, yeah, I understand that. But look, look at all these tools that are in front of you, okay? Um, you literally teach from a computer that is at your fingertips. So what do you have at your fingertips? Google Earth. If you're a geographer or a historian, you've got Google Earth and you can share from Google Earth. What else have you got? You've got Excel. If you're, if you're an accounting teacher or if you're somebody that teaches statistics, you've got, their, you've got it right there and it's so much easier to access than it was back in your classroom. All of these things are basically all inside your computer. And um, there's so much more that you can do with slideshows now on the fly because you know you were, it's so much easier to edit something uh, five minutes before class than it was ever before. Take a look at all of these tools that the storm has washed in that maybe you didn't notice before and it might open your mind to the new ways that you can teach. If we're going to go on to this journey and move on to the new world, okay, understand that, like I said before, you're not going back. This is going to go to the new world. The genie is out of the bottle. And one really good example of this as instructors, if you really think that you're going back, do consider this issue, okay? If you were a writing teacher and um, you wanted to teach academic writing, you must admit that machine translation tools like DeepL or Google Translate has completely changed the game. You you cannot try to teach anymore without thinking about the fact that your students may or may not have used these automatic translation tools. I teach English as a foreign language, and it is just too easy, especially if you're at home and your assignment is getting kind of overdue, to actually, it is too easy to use DeepL or, or Google Translate. Now, you could put down a, blank rule, a blanket rule and say, if I catch you using that, you fail this course uh, automatically, and that is considered plagiarism at this university. Some universities have actually made that blanket rule. That's considered plagiarism at this university, and you will be kicked out of this university. You could do that, okay? But DeepL and Google Translate are still not going anywhere, so the problem is only going to accelerate next year when this software just keeps getting better and better, and you will not have um, the tells uh, that DeepL and Google have. Like, for example, the tells that come out of Japanese translation is Japanese doesn't normally use third-person pronouns as often as they do in English. So to properly translate into English, the software has to guess at using a third person pronoun and they use statistics to do it. And statistically, the third person pronoun is usually male. It's usually he or him. But if it's actually a woman that's actually the target of that third person pronoun, then that's a tell. That will change, okay? And think about I don't know if you remember this. Uh, I'm, I'm 59 years old and I was in junior high school in the mid seventies and all the way through uh, the, uh, the early eighties when I graduated high school, calculators were frowned upon in the classroom. They were frowned upon when you were doing your homework and they were certainly, certainly, uh, if you were caught using them during a test, I don't know how you could do that. Um, but if you were caught using them during a test, you failed the test. Now it turns out the SAT math the, the math section of the SAT in America, if you don't actually carry a calculator into the test room with you, they're telling you you're going to be at a great disadvantage. So these tools that were once scorned and, 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 and looked upon as being, oh, how dare you do that? That's cheating. Why don't you use your brain? Are now an integral part of the actual learning experience. And if you think machine translation is not going to affect academic writing in the same way, and I think you still don't understand this first part, that the genie is out of the bottle. We have to alter our tool sets so that we can accept the fact that this tool is here. But if we learn how to use this tool for our advantage, for example, instead of teaching the nitty gritty of the subject verb object, teach structure, teach the con uh, com uh, comparison and contrast, teach the, argument the argumentative um, um, uh, discourse in writing. You have room for that now because you can show uh, how a, a proper deep L translation goes and you can move up to the next level. If you want a guide in terms of how you can think about uh, transitioning your classroom, one really good guide that already exists is called the SAMR model. 
And this uh, acronym is read from the bottom. So S-A-M-R, SAMR. And down at the bottom, there's the idea of substitution. So if we're thinking about emergency remote teaching, we basically substitute a classroom for a desk in your home office. Uh, we substitute uh, your, uh, your stage presence on a dais with a video recording on an LMS. SAMR's A, the augmentation part of things, means that now you're going, now that you have a little bit of um, room uh, to think about uh, how to improve what you're doing, or maybe at least uh, get out of the emergency remote teaching uh, mode of thinking, there you use technology to actually mm, augment what it is that you first use to just try to do your best. And that's enhancement. You're, you're starting to actually enhance your situation so that then you can get at least back up to where you were before. Where you were before. The transformation occurs when you start thinking about the modification of your pedagogy and the redefinition of your purposes. So if you were somebody who just used the same textbook every year, and maybe you waited for the new edition to come out, and you knew how to run a classroom, and you did a bit of group work with, you know, filling in the blanks and maybe going over vocabulary in the way that you've always done, maybe the, the pandemic and, and remote teaching has given you the opportunity or forced you in, into the situation where you had to try to learn um, uh, task-based learning. And it turned out that it wasn't so bad. So now you're looking for more digital tools to want to actually do that. That's where you're already at the modification of your existing tool set. Then if you go beyond that and you think about, well, you know, I heard about this thing called project-based learning, which is very similar to, to task-based learning, but you do it over an entire semester and you try it and it, it succeeds. And if you, you do it well, it mostly does succeed. And students, you know, um, definitely tend to get something out of it once it's delivered very well. Then you're into redefining your entire tool set. And you're on to different things and maybe can go on to even better things. You're going from enhancement to transformation. And if you want to think about another model, another way to think about this, we go back to my friend, uh, Professor Jenkins, and how he talked about his own idea called the Sudsy model. Okay, the Sudsy model is the idea of going from static delivery. So when you're in a digital, this is specific to digital delivery. Sudsy is about digital delivery or online teaching. So you have a static model where the student basically doesn't do anything. And those are the teachers that uh, basically just recorded their chalk and talk lectures, put it on the LMS, and maybe put out, um, you know, um, a packet of, of uh, or an email of um, things that the students have to do. They basically had no interaction with the LMS itself. Then you go into something dynamic where you're using quizzes or you're using tests uh, from the LMS. That will begin to elevate you. El I'm sorry elevate you to the point where you can actually take the next step to doing something communicative through the LMS, either synchronously or asynchronously through text or through video, asynchronous video, or maybe through live interaction on Zoom through a synchronous class. And then you start thinking about exploration. And exploration means to leave the actual Moodle, to leave the actual class and do research in the library, or to go on and do other things that are beyond your actual classroom that you ask the students to participate in. This is where the LMS really shines. And this is again related to the idea of looking at your tools in a different way. I'm starting to run out of time here, so I'm going to have to start speeding up a bit. Um, reassess what is possible. For example, I'm going to show you uh, an example of what I did uh, during last year in 2020 when I still wanted my students to try to do speaking assignments. I came up with this idea called the Hi. walking video. Uh, my name is Jose Cruz. Uh, Jose is my given name uh, and Cruz is my family name. So you can call me Mr. Cruz. Uh, so basically, this is an example of what I student, what I wanted the students to deliver. Basically, I wanted them to hold out their phones and turn on their video cameras and record themselves doing a two-minute or three-minute speaking exercises while they were walking around outside. And the reason why I wanted them to do it while they're walking is because of the increased cognitive load that the physical task imposes on second language speakers. Standing there or sitting there, especially if all you're doing is reading, is way, way easier than making up language while you're walking, operating a cell phone, trying to maintain your eye contact, and thinking about gestures. And the rubric demanded that they do all of those things. 
So if you want to try something like those walking videos, or you want to do something like looking to the world outside of your classroom, you can take apvia.org. And if you look that up uh, in Google or go straight to that URL, you're going to see, uh, well, Apvia stands for Asia Pacific Virtual Exchange Association. And this is run by a friend of mine, Eric Hagley, as well as his cohorts out of Latin America and all over the world to provide an opportunity from students in classrooms from different countries to come together asynchronously through this virtual exchange program to talk to each other. And through that communication with, with less uh, direction, with less oversight from their teachers to learn from each other, uh, talking about topics like, uh, you know, your national food, uh, your national sport, um, and then um, working out their communication problems together has been apparently a huge success. And unfortunately, I can't talk about it too much here, but if you want to hear about it directly from um, Eric Hagley, he's a very, very friendly man uh, from his home state in Australia. I'm sure he'll talk about it. And if you want to participate, he'll hook you up. Another concept that I have um, from people, if you're still thinking about other ideas, um, you know, how to take new approaches to your to your classroom, think about FaceTime. Now, FaceTime is Apple's name for its proprietary video conferencing solution. But I think of it as a way to think about your the, the behavior of your students in your classroom. Specifically, in what direction are your students' faces pointed? Are your students' faces pointed down? So what I call face down time, or are your students' faces pointed up, face up time? And are your students' faces pointed up to the teacher, so it's one-to-one -one between the instructor and the student, or are they pointed toward their peers? So it's peers actually speaking to each other. Are you making them spend a lot of time filling in the blanks and, or, or maybe thinking about what they're gonna say? That's the stuff that you can do outside of the classroom and you will be very heavily aided by digital delivery and digital systems. The more that you can take that face down time, which might be necessary. I mean, you need to study vocabulary and things like that, but the more that you can make that face down time outside of the classroom and get students to prepare themselves uh, for work in the classroom, I think that's something that uh, will enhance things overall uh, for your uh, teaching uh, experience. Lastly, let's remember to take care of each other. Let's remember to pay attention to our students' mental health uh, and use these four core concepts that I actually talked about in my book about communication, critical thinking, compassion, and community. These are things that we learned how to do better during this, uh, this um, uh, 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 during COVID-19, the age of COVID-19. Compassion for our students, using critical thinking to reassess our tools and reassess our materials and reassess the concepts that we teach. We communicate with each other within communities. Let's not let that go. Uh, pay attention to the issues uh, like neurodiversity, kids with light autism, kids with dyscalculia, uh, kids with, um, well, dysgraphia. Uh, student physical and mental health, uh, we start paying attention to that, that might actually lead to using these enhanced tools to create remote programs. Now, I'm not a big fan of hybrid or high flex. I really don't think that has a place in uh, outside of the pandemic situation. But if you take what is possible from that and use them for dedicated remote teaching, distance education uh, for kids that are in remote areas or with limo limited mobility, kids that uh, need um, assistance in moving around, I think that is another uh, potential area uh, in, uh, in uh, what it is that we can do. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the digital stage, but I'm actually almost at the end. So I'm going to try to make this real quick. And I'm, not, I'm going to try to talk about this in terms of what is important um, from, the, uh, from the most important aspects. So I wanted to wear uh, both my, my microphone here, and I wanted to use my main microphone because when I talk about audio in my book, I'm sorry, when I talk about the digital stage in my book, it's the concept of the idea that um, you actually and I have someone whose microphone is on, I will mute that person. Um, I wanted to talk about how audio really is the first thing that you have to target if you want to enhance your tool set. Okay. Because if you think about watching something on YouTube, what is more likely to make you turn off that YouTube video? Was it because the video was bad or because there was really grating audio in there somewhere? Probably it was the audio. 
We can tolerate a lot in terms of bad video, bad video quality, but if the audio quality goes down, um, that's something that's probably going to make you want to stop. And it's probably going something that's going to make your want to stu your students want to stop too. So I'm going to give you some examples. Okay. First, this is my I used to do podcasts and video, I'm sorry, voice recording. So I have an expensive microphone and I use it a lot because, you know, I, I want to give you the best experience uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to have when you're listening to my presentations. But I'm now going to change my Zoom microphone and I'm going to use the internal microphone on my iMac. And using the internal microphone on my iMac, I sound different. I know that I do. Uh, I know that you can pick up more echoes in this room. And this is what your internal microphone sounds like. And maybe you thought this internal microphone, yeah, I know. That's why I bought like a, a gamer headset or I bought this microphone uh, that uh, maybe isn't as good as yours, Jose, but um, I think it's okay, isn't it? The only way you can really know is to actually get into a Zoom room, hit the record button, record yourself against that internal microphone, switch back to the microphone you want to try and listen. Have you actually tested your microphone setup? Because um, sometimes I got to tell you, I've been in a lot of um, professional development conferences in the last couple of weeks. And in some cases, I got to say, uh, it, it was really unfortunate because I really wanted to hear that speaker speak, but maybe they didn't understand just how bad that microphone was performing. And it was really hard to hear. them. I want to give you a recommendation for a microphone. This microphone, yeah, it sounds really nice, but it's really expensive. It's like hundreds of dollars and, uh, and you know, you need specialized knowledge to actually set it up. But you don't need a lot of knowledge to set up one of these, a Lavalier microphone. And uh, first of all, I have no financial affiliation with any of these companies that make these things, but this is made by a company called Rode, R-O-D-E. It's called a Rode Smart Lav, and I'm going to try to find it right now in my um, browser and share my browser with you uh, and um, show you a list here. That's it there, that's the Rode Smart Lab. And the link I'm about to give you is um, to um, an Amazon Japan page that shows all of these products. Now you don't wanna buy these from Amazon Japan because then they're gonna be shipped from Japan, but it just shows you the actual list of items that I often recommend to my friends when they ask me, hey, Jose, that's an interesting microphone. What are the parts that I need? Well, you're going to need these parts if you have a, um, an iMac. Uh, but here, let me put these, this URL first in chat. Remember, I'm sorry, no, that's, that went to just one person. No, I got to put that into everybody here. Remember, uh, you don't want to order these from Japan. You just want to look at this list and then order it from your local Amazon. So let me go back to my, my main camera here. I'm going to switch to this microphone, okay? Uh, there it is. Now, this microphone doesn't actually sound that much different from this microphone. And the nice thing about it, because it's a Lavalier mic, it's not as distracting, it's not as bulky, it doesn't block my view of my keyboard. I've learned how to not let it block my view of my keyboard, and I've learned how to manipulate it well, but there is no problem with this, okay? This is out of the way, it is less distracting. If you're wearing something dark, your students can't even see it, so they're not all thinking about, hey, Mr. Cruz, cool microphone, where'd you buy it? And you don't have to end up having to explain that all the time. If I have one recommendation for instructors to actually do in terms of a microphone, it is this Lavalier mic with an extension cord that you can purchase. And that's also there in the list. This extension cord is six meters long. If you have a whiteboard back here, then you can actually start working on that whiteboard, manipulate the, uh, the camera so that then it can see you and the sound doesn't change. Now, if I was over here, I have to be within this pickup field area with this very nice mic. But if I wanted to suddenly go over to that whiteboard, that sound would fade. It won't fade on this lav mic. There are a whole bunch of other things that I wanted to recommend to you, but I, I have time for only one. It is nighttime right now in Japan. And even though in my room, I perceive this room to be very bright because I have two very bright overhead lights above me, watch, watch what happens when I turn off this one light. If I was to depend only on the room lighting, if I was doing a night class, my face becomes very dark. Now, it's not that you can't see it. And, um, and if I come out from under the shadow of the overhead light, there isn't as much contrast on my face, but my face is still dark. Let me turn that light back on. Now I look much better lighted, and that's why I call it the digital stage. 
the framing of my from my bust shot from my head being in the upper third of the frame the room that i have sorry the room that i have to actually stretch my elbows out all the way to the sides this allows me to gesture heavily if i wanted to actually show a, a document or something to my students i have plenty of room to do it I'll, i see a lot of people with their faces right up to the camera and i don't know maybe they still like gesturing I know that a lot of people have limited workspaces, but you want to try to aim for a digital shot that looks like this. I think I'm pretty much out of time. There were a lot of other things I wanted to show you, but you know, uh, I, I, I tend to go on a lot. Uh, I wanna thank you all very much for attending my presentation. Um, if I can just give a, a bit of a shout out, this is the book that I wrote. A lot of the things I wanted to talk about are in this book. And this book is uh, printed by Waze Goose Press and it's distributed in Greece and Cyprus by Philip Dietschy. Um, if you are thinking about doing some more Zoom work, I think it's going to be a very, book, a very good book for you to pick up because there's a lot of information in it. Um, yeah, and oh, and if you want to get my email, sorry about this. If you wanted to get my email to contact me, um, that's it right there jose at goldfish365.com. Uh, take that down, or um, I will stay in the room for just a few more minutes, even after I say goodbye. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can, you can talk to me a little bit there. Maybe open up your microphones and uh, maybe ask me a question. But otherwise, right now, I am officially finished. Thank you very much.